discovery is a landscape that you learn to see. And once you see it, then you begin to see it everywhere. The development of New York in the 1718th century, the development of the North in the 1718th century, depends on enslaved African labor. Everybody assumed that slavery was really a part of the order. If you're thinking about race, it's a tension that goes back and forth, and it's, do we hide the truth? Do we deal with the truth? The Atlantic Ocean crashes into the west coast of Africa. Along this coastline, an estimated 12 million captured Africans began their forced journey to the Americas. Almost two million would die before completing the Middle Passage on this ocean. The survivors would arrive in a new world, enslaved. Slavery was a national institution, but really the most pressing exigency of this new world was labor. It was the thing that was most necessary, and it put the slave trade and the Caribbean trade and the labor of captive people, it put it right in the center of things. It's very important for us to acknowledge that this happened. Enslavement of African peoples has had a detrimental effect on uh, communities all across the globe. When we think of slavery in the United States, we may first think of the South. Yet historians say New Yorkers should understand, although it has rarely been taught, their city was right in the middle of slavery. The Africans clear the forest, they build the road, they dredge the harbor, they build the wall along Wall Street, and they later build the wall along Chamber Street. By the middle of the 18th century, New York had almost the same population of enslaved Africans percentage-wise as Charleston, South Carolina. And since the enslavement of captured African people was such a fundamental part of life in the early days of New York City, we should not be surprised to learn that it's part of the history of Trinity Church, whose first church building was constructed in 1697. We know that Trinity Church is at the center of the uh, colonial ruling classes regime. Close ties with the most prominent merchants, close ties with prominent slaveholders, close ties with government officials. One of the things that happens is some of the surviving records talk about how prominent New Yorkers had assigned slaves to work in building and constructing the original Trinity Church. To consult of ye most easy methods in carrying on the building of a church for the Protestants of ye Church of England, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Emmett, Captain Toddle, and Captain Wilson have each of them lent a Negro to work on Wednesday next for ye opening the ground for the foundation, and that ye twelve managers of the church building do each find a Negro or laborer to be employed on the said building for 14 days, and each member present send a Negro. Trinity Church Meeting Minutes, 1696 and 1697 was very typical to, to lend and borrow. You owned the person, you owned their time. You were never going to face them in the marketplace, despite all their training and all the things that they knew how to do. One of the things that characterized Trinity Church, and to a certain extent, Anglicanism in America in the 18th and 19th century said that our role is not necessarily to change the world, but to minister to the world as it is. In 1697, the same year enslaved laborers helped build the first church, Trinity issued the first of two policies in church history dealing with segregation after death. That after the expiration of four weeks from the dates hereof, no Negroes be buried within the bounds and limits of the churchyard of Trinity Church, and that no person or Negro whatsoever do presume after the term above limited to break up any ground for the burying of his Negro, a resolution in the Vestry Minutes of Trinity Church, October 25th, 1697. A second policy of burial segregation, lasting less than a decade, came in 1790. In reality, Trinity's policy on segregated graveyards was very fluid and nuanced. Exceptions were made for enslaved blacks who were communicants of Trinity Church, and the cemetery at St. Paul's Chapel was available to them. The church donated land for one burial ground for people of African descent in what is now Tribeca and helped St. Philip's Church establish another black cemetery on what is now a playground on the Lower East Side. Trinity Church, as a church of the Anglican Communion, felt it was important to minister to this slave population, as most of the, the African American community in the 18th century was enslaved. Trinity Church is one of the earliest churches to say that that's really part of our ministry. 
Less than a decade after using enslaved laborers to help build its church and segregating its burial grounds, Trinity worked with a French Huguenot named Elias No, who's buried in the Trinity churchyard, to teach black New Yorkers to read as well as to provide religious instruction. I think it's important for us to be honest about our past. We were comfortable making a distinction between pastoral care and social advocacy. And so we cared for people who were slaves, pastorally. But we didn't do the tough work of social advocacy to abolish slavery. However, after Noe's death in 1722, Trinity Church continued his efforts to provide education and religious instruction to New York City's black population. Trinity is involved throughout the 18th and, 19th, and beginning 19th century in education. I think this is one of the, the strong points in the history of Trinity Church. Most slave-owning families in colonial New York had two or three enslaved Africans living in attics and cellars and providing unpaid labor. And the lives of those captives were harsh. They were not free to gather together, to drink together in a tavern, to take a walk without permission. They could be beaten without any cause. Daniel Horsemanden was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the province of New York. He was not a slave owner, but was a Trinity vestryman, a church warden, married the widow of Trinity's first rector, and is buried in the churchyard. During a six-month period of panic, over what was considered a plot by enslaved blacks to revolt and take over the city by setting fires, Horsemanden oversaw a series of trials. And he became the recorder for the trial and represented white interests and the white viewpoint that these black captive workers were inclined to evil. The people in general might be persuaded of the necessity there is for everyone that has Negroes, to keep a very watchful eye over them and not to indulge them with too great liberties, which we find they make use of to the worst purposes. Daniel Horsemanden, 1747. Horsemanden interrogated witnesses, determined verdicts, and meted out penalties which more than 30 times involved capital punishment in a process whose judicial procedures seem highly questionable. You have confessions of people who are being threatened with being burned at the stake, and you have a Irish indentured servant girl who is given her freedom and given a stipend in exchange for her testimony. So what we end up happening is about 35 people are either hung or burned alive at what is now fully square, what is then the collect. By the time of the revolution, opposition to slavery in New York was growing, and two of the people history often calls the Founding Fathers, Trinity Churchwarden John Jay and pewholder Alexander Hamilton, were active in that movement. They also established the African Free School in 1787 on Cliff Street on land provided by Trinity Church. In the 1780s, Hamilton and Jay both pushed for gradual amanuition in the state of New York, and again, what we're looking at, I think, again, is an important role of Trinity parishioners, Trinity vestrymen, Trinity leaders, in finally ending slavery in New York. Emancipation in New York happened over a 30-year period, with slavery officially ending in 1827, and with the attitude of politicians still fixated on the idea of property. Before the arrival of that period, most colored persons born previous to the 4th of July, 1799, and others now free by the existing laws, will have become of very little value to their owners. Indeed, many will, by that time, have become expensive burden. New York Governor Daniel Tompkins, 1817. By the 19th century, more European immigrant workers are arriving in New York, and the city's economy is growing explosively. New York had outlawed slavery, but profits from the sugar industry, from fabrics made from cotton, from loaning money to southern plantation owners, profits generated by slavery, were making many New York businessmen very rich. And we think that it's important for those institutions, those systemic institutions that have played a role, um, to examine themselves and to be able to come to terms with what has happened. In December 1860, those businessmen, including Trinity member William Backhouse Astor, met in a building on this street at 33 Pine in a meeting attended by an estimated 2,000 people 
in a last-ditch effort to avoid the Civil War. Northern merchants centered in New York, meeting at Pine Street, are committed to finding a way to avoid war, avoid secession, essentially to avoid the emancipation of blacks. There was a large amount of saying by saying, well, look, you know, our, our economics is tied to shipping cotton from the South to England. We have to be open to Southerners. Understandable weakness, but that's a weakness. At this same time, the mayor of New York, Fernando Wood, who's buried in Trinity's Uptown Cemetery and who had a son baptized at Trinity Church, presented his own idea about secession. In January 1861, Fernando Wood, in a message to the city council, actually calls on New York to secede from the Union to maintain commercial ties with the slave South. Part of what the American slavery system did was link a racial theory to an economic theory that advantaged some people and disadvantaged others. It's easy for me to sort of deny personal responsibility, but when I see that I am part of an economic system that was radically racialized early in this country when the foundations were set, then I can start looking at myself for personal responsibility for some of the remedies. Post-Civil War, urban life changes dramatically with the Industrial Revolution, and Trinity Church, again reflecting its times, shifts the focus of its ministries. In the second half of the 19th century, the fact is that the urban plight of, of the new industrialization meant that the gap between rich and poor became greater. And so what you're seeing is that churches are creating uh, settlement houses and missions which are going to deal with the social concerns of individuals. Trinity is, of course, going to create all sorts of missions. And this is going to involve the idea that a chief role of the, of the minister or priest is to be involved in social reconstruction. Trinity Church's stewardship of the land given to it by Queen Anne in 1705 has contributed to the growth of New York. And that growth, which created the city's worldwide importance, has in turn increased the value of Trinity's land, enabling the church to sustain its mission internationally into a fourth century. We are looking at the emergence of this village as one of the major commercial centers and shipping ports in the entire world. Now, part of the reason is the connection of New York City, banks and merchants, to the sale of slave-produced commodities that help make New York City this commercial center. Like Trinity, any church, any company, any university and landowner, in fact, any person who lives in New York City, receives some benefit from its stature as an international metropolis, a financial and cultural center, a city whose economic legacy is built, at least in part, on slavery. I think we at Trinity need to acknowledge that Trinity was involved in slavery, that we were involved deeply in that brokenness, that we benefited from that brokenness, and that we have work to do now and in the future to help heal that brokenness. There are no excuses. We acknowledge what we've done. We're honest about it. We're learning from it and I hope it will bring us into a more vigorous and hopeful future. New Yorkers are only beginning to understand that their city was a major player in a national system of captive labor, a system that the United States itself is slow to acknowledge. There's been a very dominant narrative out there that you know we've all had to buy hook, line, and sinker, and now that there is an alternative, and there are many perspectives on that history, and African Americans specifically, they're demanding to have a place in the history and in the narrative. I think the history is coming out of the ground. I think that the story of, of enslavement in America is a story that will not stay buried. This is a story that we need to integrate into our national history so that we can really and truly know who we are.